Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam President. What can we say about Representative Rita Harris? As, um, as Madam President just said, um, she is one of our mm -hmm. own. I, if I can take a personal minute to, of a uh, uh, personal pleasure to let you know that I remember just a few tally days ago where she was sitting in the office and I just reminded her of that. She was standing in the off at HDO and she was wondering, how can I make a difference? How can I know what to do? And I remember our fearless, uh, our fearless leader, um, uh, Vice Chair uh, Judy Mao and I were praying with her that she would find a way that she can serve her community and she can make a change. And now she has been elected as the um as the uh I just lost my place. Now she's been elected for a uh, state representative for District 44. Um, her journey dates back to 2017. Um, her daughter had just started college and she was trying to decide whether to go back to school or go back to work. Um, she's been elected as vice chair of the Orange County Democratic Party. Um, she was elected in 2022 for the first time. And if you've seen her in action, which we just did this week, you will see how, how transparent she was, how she is fearless when he is, she is talking to our uh, talking to everyone regarding some of these bills. I'm just so proud to have her. Representative Harris, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Francine. I really appreciate that. And um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm always excited to be among um, the Democratic Women's Club of Florida because it is my home. Uh, it is, um, you all are family to me. Um, and it is where I got my start. And I always tell people, um, you know, they, they, I got a lot of compliments on my campaign, how well run it was. And I always tell people, well, if you're thinking about running for office, or if you're thinking about helping someone run for office, you need to get involved with the Democratic Women's Club of Florida, because all of the trainings and all of the, um, you know, even the candidate trainings with Stacey Peters all helped um, when I decided to throw my hat in the ring, I felt like I had an advantage because I knew so much um, of what was going to be coming. And 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 then, of course, all of the great trainings with Kevin Winchell, I knew what I needed to do. Um, and so I didn't go in there. I am so sorry. Let's try that again. It's okay. It's okay. It's Zoom. It's still the, the Zoom gremlins. Yeah, I was um, trying to mute someone and I got <laughs> by mistake. So sorry. Go ahead. So, so that being said, um, I'm also really thankful for not only the campaign training that I've had, but um, just the Um, because there have been, this has been a really unusual session. So I'm a freshman coming into one of the most unusual sessions I think that um, Florida has seen, in, at least in our modern lifetime. I know that the number of bad bills coming through so far um, is what we might expect in a normal 60 day session. And we're only a week in. Um, so we have already tackled, uh, we tackled a horrible uh, giveaway to private schools uh, where they are not required to, uh, you know, accept uh, the IEPs of students with disabilities. Uh, they're not required to accept um, any student. They're allowed to have discriminatory admission processes, and they're taking um, public money, and they're allowed to do this. And in fact, um, they don't even have to have the same type of uh, their their faculty to they don't have to have the same criteria as the public schools. Um, and I asked in, on Thursday in questions uh, what the requirements were for their teachers. And I was told by the bill sponsor that they had to have a bachelor or special skills. Well, what are these special skills? 
who who are these special skills being credentialed by? Um, you know, what I've heard from people is that there are people right out of high school teaching at these schools. Um, and so it is, yeah, so they're not required to have a degree. A degree or special skills is what they're required to have. And they're taking public funding. And what happens is a lot of students go to these private schools and then get put back into public schools and they're behind. And then it's up to public school teachers who are already overworked and underpaid to get these private school students ahead. Now, that's not to say that I, I understand sometimes people People decide to put their children in a private school. Um, there are there are Catholic schools, there are Muslim schools, there are Jewish schools, but these are there are these are private schools that are not that are taking public funds and are not required to have the same rules as our public schools. And I don't think that's fair. So I voted against that and, and I did a floor debate. Um, this week coming up, what we're expected to hear. This week, if you're tracking, is um, HB3, which is the ESGs or the quote unquote woke banks. Um, everything's woke uh, if they, you don't like it. Um, so apparently now the banks are woke because they might have a DE&I -E program. Um, they might have a realization that maybe their practices in the past might have been discriminatory and they're working to make sure that moving forward, their lending practices are um, you know more fair and equitable. Now the governor has declared them woke and he He's going after them. We're also going to be hearing this big, huge housing omnibus bill, which um, you know is one of those bills where it's it's big, it's heavy. There's a lot of stuff in it, and on the surface, you might think, "Great, they're tackling housing." We know how much this state needs help with housing, but unfortunately, it preempts uh, home rule and takes away power from you know the counties to put in place their own uh, you know um, you know uh, housing. Uh, you know, policy. And we know, uh, you know, anytime this governor, um, you know, tries to grab power, we know it's a, it's an issue because that's what he's done this whole entire time that he's been in office. Um, yeah, I know exactly. Um, also, we're going to be hearing 543, which is permitless carry. Um, and that's been another horrendous bill that maybe we would only see one of these in a session that this is now one of like four or five now that we've already seen in, in the first two weeks. So permitless carry, of course, is, um, you know, we call it untrained carry. Um, you're not required to have training. Um, you can carry a gun. Um, they're also uh, looking to lower the age from 21 to 18, which we all know that that, that age increase was put in place after Parkland. Um, and that we know that, you know, raising the age to 21 uh, lowers gun violence. Statistics have shown this. And we also know that states that implement a permitless carry gun violence increases by 35%. We know that it's not just uh, these, these mass shootings that, that are an issue for gun violence. Um, I, you know, Moms Demand Action has done a really good job at educating, I think, the public about how, you know, gun violence is also happens in the home. It's very quiet. It doesn't get national headlines. Um, you know, people who are experiencing um, depression are more likely to um, harm themselves when there's a gun in the home. So, you know, these issues are really important to Floridians. And unfortunately, we have a governor that is running for president. It is not doing anything to help Floridians, but it's just passing a whole bunch of bills that get his minority of base excited so that he can, you know, basically follow his ambitions to become president. I don't know if anybody had any questions, but that's, that was no, basically no, no. my rant. Francine, <laughs> Francine, do you want to take the questions? Yes, let me see. You know what? I can start with, with a question I have. You just spoke last week. Was it last? Today is no, earlier this week regarding. No, I'm sorry. Today's Monday. <laughs> the days are just getting getting Believe away me. from us. Um, regard, you were talking about the um, you were talking about the bill regarding um, how do parents notify the school system that they are against these vouchers? Well, you know what? Most of you say that you're for the vouchers. You're just not for the millionaires with the vouchers going to the private schools. Am I correct? Well, how I feel about the vouchers is that it is a way to take money from a public school and put it into a private school. Private schools are allowed to create their own scholarship program and they're allowed to 
allow a certain number of students into their schools um, and, and give them lower tuition. But what we're doing with HB1, which passed, unfortunately, it passed last week, um, uh, you know, pretty much a long party line is that we're taking public funds and giving them to private schools to then take an $8,000 coupon and, and pass it along to people who a lot of these people who are going to be getting this $8,000, um, you know, voucher, already their kids are already going to private school so it's kind of like a coupon and it, and a lot of them will be millionaires and a lot of them will have the the funds to already put their kids in these schools but they get now a little eight thousand dollar giveaway that's taken from the public fund to go to these private schools and one of the things that democrats did was that they put amendments forward that would try to make this bill a little bit more you know, even the playing field between private schools and public schools. So what they did is they they filed an amendment, like I said, asking that these private schools be required to follow uh, an IEP for disabled students. And that was voted down. Um, so these private schools don't function under the same umbrella as a public school. They don't have the same requirements for curriculum. They don't have the same requirements for faculty, but they are taking public money. And there have been, yes, there have been quote unquote scholarships in the past, but this is a very broad movement of funding from public school to private school. And it will impact public school. Absolutely, because we've already seen an impact in public schools just from the HOPE scholarships that have been that, that were really kind of pushed during uh, COVID when uh, people were being encouraged to take their kids out of public school if they didn't like the mask uh, policies. And, you know, I can speak for Orange County Public School when they say that that did impact their budget, you know, because when kids are taken out of public school, that funding is also taken away. And it's an issue. It is an issue. And there is an issue with uh, with oversight that we've also, uh, I think, I don't remember which representative did bring up the fact that we also don't know um, how these schools are built. If there's even someone to go in and make sure that the, the, their, the building is properly um, put together so that they're safe. I mean, this is a big issue. And once again, Private schools have always been allowed to exist. People have always had the quote unquote choice to put their kids in a private school or to homeschool. But what we're doing now is taking public funds and putting them into private schools that have no oversight and don't have to answer to anybody. Changing course a little bit. Um, Sheila Jaffe has asked, pensions will invest in tobacco uh, again when the taxpayers pay the health care costs. Can you um, can you speak on that at yeah, all? So yeah, so she's talking, yeah, so um, she's referencing HB3, which is the ESGs, which is where, you know, the, the governor is saying that we're going to divest from these woke banks, our pensions, and they will probably be reinvested into other other avenues. Is that the ESG nonsense yes. that he's talking about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what the number of the omnibus bill, housing bill I the 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 house number is House Bill uh 627. What bills have you filed? So I filed all seven of my slots were taken. Um some of the bills that I filed, I filed a Medicaid expansion with opt-in. We are only one of four states that does not have Medicaid expansion, and that would have really helped especially uh, people with disabilities, um, especially those like on the waiver program waiting. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of parents of children with disabilities who are now aging out of that and they worry, well, what will happen to me? You know, what will happen to my child when, when something happens to me? Um, we filed the drop program, uh, which would allow, um, it would allow uh, school uh, faculty, including um school nurses, guidance counselors, bus drivers uh, to come back um, out of retirement and work and um, if they wouldn't have to wait the 12 months that they have to wait. And that includes also being able to volunteer. So we have a school board member in Orange County who retired and because of the way it's set up, she can't even volunteer at her child's school. Um, so this would allow people to come back to work when, when right now we desperately need teachers and we need, need bus drivers. Like I don't, I've heard so many stories of kids basically waiting waiting at the side of the road for a bus driver. We have a bus driver shortage. Um, so that would help with that. Um, um, I filed um, 
a Holocaust Remembrance Day because of the rise in anti-Semitism. I felt like it was really important to say something about that. In my district Thank alone, you. we had three acts of anti-Semitism, including at a school. Um, so, you know, I think it's really important. important. Um, our governor, unfortunately, is not pushing back against it. So, you know, I feel like, you know, compelled to do that. Um, I filed, of course, uh, the um, the 15-week abortion ban repealer bill, bill, excuse me, that would basically put us back to 24 weeks, um, no to doctor requirement. It would put us back um, where we were before they put in the 15-week abortion ban. Um, you know, I know that this legislat legislature isn't going to pass that bill, but I think it's really important that we let people know that Democrats are still fighting for that, um, that we believe in the right to freedom. We believe in the right to bodily autonomy. Um, and speaking of bodily autonomy and freedom, I also filed the um, gay and trans panic um, defense ban, um, because what we have learned is that um, people who use this as a defense, even if they're charged with a crime, they get less of a sentence um, if they say that they were panicked because the person was LGBTQ. Um, that So that um, is a, a bill that I filed. And um, oh, gosh. Oh, yes. And a, a, a health and trans, sorry, a transparency and health care bill. Um, so that way, um, doctors and other uh, medical practices would have to, um, you know, place it in a, in a public place if they don't, um, if they don't give certain services. Um, you know, if they don't give out gender affirming care or they don't do reproductive care, um, they would have to make that known so that, you know, nobody is wasting their time basically going to look for medical services that a doctor is not providing. So those are the bills that I filed. Um, and then I filed a bill for my friend, Nancy. I don't know, some of you might've known Nancy Whited. She was very popular, very big in the local um, democratic circles, especially during 08. Um, she worked really hard to get Obama elected in Orange County, and um, she suffered from polycystic kidney disease and ended up losing both of her kidneys. Um, but she had a live donor, but the process is really sort of cumbersome. So we filed a bill to, to help streamline some of the processes for a live donor um, and recipient so that, you know, people are able to, if the, a live donor is the best way. Uh, to go. And if you have a live donor, there's no reason why you should be waiting 18 months to receive a kidney transplant. And unfortunately, that is how long uh, Nancy waited. And in the process, she passed away. So this is really, uh, you know, an ode to her. She was a good friend. Um, she was a supporter of mine. She was an incredible Democratic woman. And, you know, I'm filing this bill in her honor. So those are the bills that I filed this session. Thank you. Thank you for filing those bills. I mean, your passion behind them is just so it's 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 so you and and we really appreciate it. Um I'll change the what is happening with the period issue. Um just to let you know, um trans, period of transparency. That was <laughs> sadly that was my area um state representative who uh <laughs> went toe to toe with Representative Gant <laughs> and got scorched. Um, however, <laughs> the bill still passed. So do you know what, was that the first, first reading or? I'm not sure if that was first or second reading. I think it might've been second reading and Eleanor was so kind enough to put that in the chat. It's um, HB 1069. And yes, Rep Gant. So if you all don't know Rep Gant, you all need to know Rep Gant because she is amazing. And thank you. Eleanor says that was the first committee hearing. And she um, she primaried a not so democratic democratic representative and won. And she is incredible. Um, she is she's just amazing. And yes, she asked that question and then went viral, which was great because the nation got to see what is going on in this state. Um, you know, we are talking about, you know, banning people, banning kids from talking about something so innocuous as, you know, I mean, I don't know about you, but, you know, I remember when I first got my period and I was at school and thankfully I had a teacher that I really trusted that I could go to and talk to. And I couldn't imagine what kids right now are thinking. They, they don't know who to talk to. Teachers don't know how to engage with their kids. They are, they're afraid that they're going to get in trouble if they say something and then, and, then the, and then the child says something, even without malice to their parents. And then their parents get upset. I mean, they're really creating a lot of tension in our schools at a time when, you know, there's already enough going on. Kids are, I don't know if you heard the story about how they're putting panic 
rooms in schools now. Um, in Alabama, two, two schools are putting panic rooms, which are bulletproof rooms that basically slide out and kids can go in there to hide from, from you know, if, if somebody, you know, brings a gun into their school. I mean, this is a time when kids have a lot of things to worry about. And the last thing that we need to be doing is basically making it difficult for teachers and kids to talk about the things that teachers and kids have always talked about, which is sometimes, unfortunately, you get your period at school, you got to tell your teacher, it happens. I mean, my nine-year-old self would not be able to talk to a teacher because that's when I got my period. And even though my mother prepared me, it was my teachers, my fifth grade teachers that were able to uh, kind of guide me and make me feel a little better. So um I, I just don't understand. I really don't understand. Um, um, back to schools, Jean Greenwald uh, asked, I'm concerned about the lack of oversight of the private schools. I know you mentioned it a little bit. Yeah. Um, without quality assurance, we could get we could get scam schools. I mean, how how do we find how do we get these regulations. Um, I know there's supposed to be small government and 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 lack of, you know, a lesson yeah. of regulations, but you were talking about developing a, a, a safe school. How how can we how can we get the other side to understand how just important that is? Unfortunately, I don't know if they're going to understand, Francine, and I wish I wish I had a better answer for you. I think the thing that we have to do is elect we have to get out of the super minority, elect more Democrats, and try to fix some of these bad bills that have come through, and at least add some safeguards. There are no safeguards to, to the HB1, and we need to at least amend it and add some safeguards so that they are required to at least have the same standards as a public school. Every child has the right. It's not fair to the students either, I should say, that they don't there is a possibility that some of these kids may go to a private school that is literally there just to make money and they're not going to get an education. And, and they have the right to have a good education. As of right now, yes, in this session it is. It, I'm sorry, I was answering a question. Um, uh, someone asked, is it too late to amend HB1? Yes, it passed. It, it passed. And we did try to amend it. We did try to amend it. Unfortunately, they, they voted down every single good amendment that we brought that would make that bill at least better than it was. Well, if there are no other questions, I want to thank you so much, Representative Harris, for coming on board. Madam President, do you have another question for her? We know how busy she is and how she needs to get back to. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, we appreciate um, that you joined us this evening. Um, we have a lot of teachers in the room, um, and they seems like they asked through most of the things that they wanted to touch. And no, we didn't touch the expansion. The homeschool. Um, uh, very much, but um, I think we're good. I think that we're good. I just was looking for something that would jump out that, that we hear often. Um, just wanna thank you so much. And I, I hope that we can call on you again because uh, your candor and um, just everything about you, Rita, you just ring so true and just really appreciate your your work and what you're doing. I appreciate all Thank of you. Thank you so much. I appreciate yeah. all of you. You all do. So I know the work that you do because I've, I've been on the other side doing the work and I know how, yeah. how influential, influential, how organized and, and, and how passionate you all are. So thank you so much. And I'm going to have Eleanor put my information in the chat. That way, if any of you want to reach out to me and ask me a question or you want to talk to me about anything, if you just want to vent, because believe me, I know it's tough out there. So <laughs> feel free to reach out to me anytime you need me. Some of us are going to see you next week. We are honoring you legislators for the luncheon next Yay. Tuesday. So we're looking forward to seeing you. Um, I'm sorry, Deborah Baker Ryan had her hand up. Did she have a quick question before we let Representative Harris go? Yes, Representative Harris, what's happening with your Medicaid expansion bill? So, um, Chair Clemens would have been the first uh, chair of the of the first committee that it was assigned to, and he has said, as it is, he will not agenda it. So I am working with um, some some disability rights activists, so we're going to see if we can put together something that he's willing to agenda next session. Okay, we have to do something. Good. We have to do something at least for the for the waivers. 
that yes. that, wait list, that wait list is eight it years needs to long. happen yeah yes. it, it, something needs to happen and so Absolutely you know right. we're I'm willing to work with him just to see if there's if there's something that we can he he can agree to put and say okay I can put this on an agenda so um I'll keep you all posted though um like I said I'm working with a few activists and, and we're going to see what we can come up with what bill was that Rep Harris oh I can't remember the bill the bill number I'm okay so never mind. I know I'll a bill by up. names Eleanor HB61 yes. thank you Eleanor yeah um HB61 HB61 Okay. And, and by the way, you. shout out to Eleanor and McDonald. She's she another member. Amazing. Yeah. I was so happy when they paired her with you. I mean, that is just that is just a dynamite pair. Dynamite yeah. set. I'm just yeah. really happy, really happy for <laughs> you. And you know what? Fight the good fight. Yes. And if you are, and if you're interested in working on um the uh Medicaid expansion bill, go ahead and drop me a line. Um, especially if you're in the wheelhouse of disability rights, because that we're trying to craft something that he he he, he will feel he has to agenda for for next session. So you hear mm. that, members? Okay. Yes. Thank, thank you so much. I don't want to keep you. I know you have another speaker, but thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank thank you so you. much. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Deb Daniels. So you're going to talk about Deb? Yes, I am. <laughs> she is a retired Citrus County teacher. She was heavily involved in uh, lots of organizations, such as the Citrus County Education Association, which she is the site leader. And she's also our legislative liaison. Um, she is speaking to us on behalf of Moms Demand Action. And she's actually also an associate member, besides Citrus, she's an associate member of <laughs> Marion County. So we are just so honored to have her come and speak with us about, um, about gun safety. So you have the floor, Deb Daniels. Thanks, Francine. I'm really honored to be here. Um, I'm not a rep, <laughs> I'm not, but I am, have been a, co-leader in Citrus County for Moms Demand Action for five years. So I feel like I'm, I can talk to you on that as an advocate for gun safety. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get my screen up here. Um, yeah, let me get. Let's see. slideshow. All right. So uh, Rosemary Nellis and I are the co-leaders here in Citrus County, as I said, for the last five years. Um, I'm going to talk about um, some general facts because, believe it or not, facts and truth are so important and we need to know them if we're going to be standing up to these people who are doing this propaganda uh, about gun safety. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the gun violence in Florida and children's and teens. And then I'm gonna talk about the legislation, the good, the bad, and the really ugly. And lastly, I wanna talk about the fire hose of falsehood. And what is that? And what is the solution? So I'm gonna move my cursor is kind of blocking me, okay. So Florida, 2,849 people die from guns every year. One, that's one gun death every three hours. 5,267 are wounded by guns, which we do not talk about. And not even to mention the trauma of anyone in the vicinity of those wounded or killed. We are 19th highest rated for gun violence in the US here in Florida. What does it look like? 62% of those gun deaths are suicides and 36% are homicides. And that kind of compares to the nationwide as well. So the myth, guns don't kill people. People kill people. I'm sure you've all heard someone say that to you. Hard truth is, people with guns do kill people, and more efficiently than without guns. Guns 
often kill, are more apt to kill someone than a knife or anything else. The U.S. has a gun homicide that is at a rate 25 times that of other high income countries. And the myth that they say guns don't kill people, people kill gun, uh, people kill people. It's really a good argument for us for making sure we have background checks for everyone who wants to buy a gun and keeping guns secure to prevent theft. Let's talk about children in America. Nine American children and teens under age 19 die from guns every day. Many more are injured and traumatized. In the past 20 years, more children have died from gunshots than on-duty police officers and active duty military combined. They die through suicide, intentional shootings. We do not call those accidental shootings because they are not accidents. Those children got guns that were not secure. They are unintentional shootings, but they are not accidents. There is accountability there. And of course, domestic violence, school violence and others. So the number one leading cause of death for American children and teens in our United States of America is firearm deaths. It's above motor vehicles now as it's growing. In Florida, it's the second leading cause of death among children. And as you can see, the highest is motor vehicles, not by much more than firearm deaths. But again, we register our drivers, we register our cars because they do kill. When we break it down by how those deaths are, we have in Florida, 30% of our gun deaths are suicide and 66 are homicide. So it's all, it's actually opposite. Uh, meaning if our children in Florida are dying from homicide, what does that say? I mean, it's a horrible statistic. Let's talk about the legislation this session. I want to talk about the good because I truly, from Moms Demand, actually want to, you know, commend our Democrats for going in there like Rep Harris and putting in the things that we do need to protect our, our Floridians. We um, have one um, that was put in to allow family members to petition for risk uh, protection orders, which are red flag laws. Um, we have red flag laws here in Florida, thanks to the Parkland legislation. Um, however, only police officers can petition the court for that protection order. We also have a good bill um, for Jamie's Law. And that one would require background checks for the sale and transfer of ammunition. And that is filed every session. We have um, the sale, transfer, and storage of firearms. This one's important to Moms Demand Action because we're looking at safe storage. These children that are dying in our state from getting access to a gun, it's, it's, it's enough is enough. This bill would revise um, exceptions to prohibit on storing or leaving a loaded gun within reach or easy access of a minor. It revises our safe storage um, of loaded firearms. Um, and this alone would save lives. So these are the real public safety bills that are put forth. And I wanna say these last three, these good bills, not one of them have come up in any committee. They've only been filed. So let's start, let's start looking at the bad. We have, um, and I think um, Rep Harris actually brought this one up. This is um, minimum age for firearm purchase or transfer. Um, I just wanna explain federal law prohibits people younger than 21 to buy handguns. However, the federal law, um, uh, however, it does allow for the purchase of a long gun at 18. So that's the federal law. In 2018, Florida passed a law 
that prohibits those younger than 21 to buy rifles or long guns, such as AR-15. And that was in response to the Parkland massacre by a 17-year-old. So this HB 1543 will delete that age limit measure that was produced in that Lakeland legis uh, Parkland legislation. We also have the Sales of Firearms and Ammunition Act that's um, moving through quickly. Um, I think it's on the floor of the House now, and it's been through one past one committee. Um, this one will find financial institutions that identify anyone who is buying a gun. Um, retailers use codes to identify what goods are being sold, and credit companies had started to um, put codes on gun buyers. Um, and the credit companies now, if with this bill, would be fined up to 10000 per violation. And what this bill seeks to do is to thwart a merging corporate practice of identifying and potentially flagging an individual's data after a gun purchase from a gun retailer. Because, of course, there the GOP says we cannot have any kind of firearm registry. And here's the big one. This is the ugly one. This is the one Governor uh, DeSantis has promised to sign. It has passed the Senate and the House and the committees. It's now on the floor. Um, both are mirrored by both having added provisions that would extend some of those Parkland school safety bills, uh, provisions in that bill. Current law, Florida law requires handgun um, owners to obtain a state license to carry concealed weapon to get that carry permit, the pr process currently includes a background check, fingerprinting, a training that includes instruction on firing of a loaded gun. Those requirements would be eliminated with this permitless carry. So facts, multiple studies show, as I think Rep Harris said, they have Im that have implemented permitless carry have had upticks in both gun violence and Police shootings, handgun homicide rates rose up 11% in states that weakened their gun permitting regulations, <laughs> and police shootings increased by 13% in 10 states that passed permitless carry laws from 2014 to 2020. Those are facts. In domestic violence situations, women are five times more likely to be killed if a gun is present. Gun homicide disproportionately impacts Black and Brown Americans. Hate crimes with guns are rising in the U.S. 10,300 a year every 28 per day, over 28 per day. Most target religious minorities, communities of color, and LBGTQ plus people. And of course, political violence with guns has escalated. How? Would loosening gun laws through permitless carry impact those situations? I want to talk very briefly about fire hose of falsehoods. In 2016, the Rand Corporation coined the term fire hose of falsehood, defining it as a propaganda disinformation campaign that has four features, high volume and multi-channel rapid, continuous, and repetitive, lacks commitment to objective reality, and lacks commitment to consistency. Over the past 50 years, the gun lobby has deployed disinformation campaigns that include hallmarks of this strategy. These campaigns have achieved substantial success in the judicial system, the legislative system, and in shifting public opinion on guns and gun laws. So if you need more information, uh, of course, our citrusmom7 at gmail.com is our, um, you know, our email address. But we also can go to the website for momsdemandaction.org or www.everytown.org, of course, has all the statistics that they continually um, put out there um, so that you can understand the truth about gun safety. I'm going to stop. And I'm back. 
I do want to try to do um, a little one minute, 42 second um, thing about that fire hose. I'm going to sure. try it. If it doesn't work, uh, we'll see. Oh, you know what? I didn't do the sound. Let me try it again. While she's putting that together, please put your questions in the chat. That's one of numerous myths the gun lobby has convinced many Americans to believe. The relentless promotion of misinformation about guns has real consequences, like the passage of dangerous permitless carry laws and severe funding cuts for gun violence research. This disinformation campaign is what we call a fire hose of falsehood. We'll explain the name later. The fire hose of falsehood has four main elements. It's high volume and multi-channel. It's rapid, continuous, and repetitive. It lacks commitment to objective reality, and it's inconsistent. So, what's the solution? First, on the personal level, we can create a fire hose of truth by deploying inoculation campaigns, using deep canvas tactics, focusing on at-risk populations, and avoiding censorship. On the larger strategic scale, we can circumvent polarization, we can explore beliefs and core values, we can build a fact-based foundation, and we can motivate others to action. What do all these things mean, and how do we do them? The first step is to arm ourselves with the facts about gun violence. Here are just a few, for example. Right to carry laws do not decrease crime. Having a gun in the home is associated with an increased risk in suicide, and nearly two-thirds of mass shootings perpetrated by a single shooter have been related to domestic violence. You can learn more by reading our fact sheet, guide, and white paper about countering the fire hose of falsehood at gvpedia.org. You can also check us out on social media. Stay tuned for more. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Uh-oh. Wow, glad that's over. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions for Deb? Um, Jennifer Moore would like to know, can you speak about the Be Smart program and the training? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and uh, you can go to uh, Be Smart uh, has their own uh, website. Um, and I am a Be Smart presenter as well as my friend Rosemary. I would say get a hold of us. The Be Smart program is a program for adults, it's not for children. Uh, in Citrus County, we are working to get into the SAC meetings. Um, it is all about safe storage. We know a fact that if people were responsible gun owners and locked up their guns, um, we would have less children die or less people die. Um, we know that even in a household where there's a maybe a dementia or uh, an older adult who may, um, a veteran who may be going through thinking suicidal thoughts, gun access is what we need to focus on. And that's what Be Smart does. It, it helps us understand the importance of gun access and keeping our guns locked. Piggybacking on that, what can each county, what can each person do, even if it's just little baby steps regarding gun safety? You know, uh, I also do a presentation um, uh, about don't argue with the fanatics. Um, what you need to do is go to your neighbor who has a fear that someone's taking their guns, um, kind of talk to that neighbor on find common ground. No one wants their children to be unsafe at school. They will always agree with you that we want our children to be safe. Start those conversations and 
talk about truth and the facts. The more facts you know, the better you'll be with those conversations. And finally, advocate, get your friends to help you advocate for safe um, storage. Um, tell them to tell their, their church members, their bowling team, their book clubs. The more we talk about the truth and keep it at a local grassroots level, I think that's what makes the difference. You're not going to argue with the GOP. They're not listening. Um, or the fanatic.